All right. Well, it looks like we're getting a critical mass here. I know we'll we'll expect others to be joining us shortly. Um, but but thank you all for for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader with Valley Vision and staff to the Sacramento Region's Cleaner Air Partnership Coalition. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you to the second court, uh, virtual quarterly luncheon of 2022. We're really pleased to see so much interest in the opportunities for improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gases from industry-led efforts around corporate sustainability. So to better understand who's in today's meeting, uh, why don't folks go ahead and enter your affiliation in the chat box? So just your name and your organization so we can all see who's in the room. Uh, and while you're doing that, I can provide a little bit of background for those who are new to CAP events. The Cleaner Air Partnership was created all the way back in 1986. I think some of you all were there. Um, by the Sacramento Metro Chamber in Breathe, California, Sacramento region, uh, and Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. It's currently a broad-based partnership, including business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts, uh, who are all working together to help the six-county Sacramento region protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for cleaner air. Uh, big thank you to our event sponsors, the SAC Metro Air District, Tykert, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Villa Solano Air Quality Management District, El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, North State Building Industry Association, PG&E, Semex, and the Healthy Air Alliance. I think I got all of you. Um, and then a little bit of housekeeping before diving in. Uh, the meeting is being recorded and a link will be shared with you all early next week. And you can always find recordings of Valley Vision hosted events, including our past Clean Air Partnership meetings uh, on our YouTube channel. And maybe Kathy could uh, pop that into the chat uh, when, when able. And as you've likely noticed, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar, in order to be more interactive. If you have questions you'd like to verbalize, please use the raise hand function. And then depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button. Um, those of you using the Zoom app on iPhone or Android also have this option. And then those of you calling in should dial star nine to raise or lower your hand and star six to mute or unmute yourself. Um, and of course that chat box is for comments and I'll regularly elevate questions from the chat um, into our conversation. So now I'd like to introduce Kathy Seichu, who's a Valley Vision Project Associate supporting our clean economy portfolio, including the Cleaner Air Partnership, our neighborhood air monitoring and emissions reduction work and more. Um, Kathy will be running the back end of this operation so that all goes smoothly. Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, happy to Adrian, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathy and I'm new here to Valley Vision um, and the Cleaner Air Partnership. I am excited to be here at this luncheon and just really looking forward to learning more about corporate sustainability programs from our stellar panel today. Um, before we continue, I wanna share a bit about my background. Uh, way prior to joining Valley Vision and the Cleaner Air Partnership, I worked in the hospitality sector for several years under their food division at Macy's. Um, after that, I was a planning technician at Yolo County Transportation District, where I worked on um, transportation planning projects and community outreach activities. And during that time, I graduated from Sacramento State with a degree in regional planning. And here I am today, um, putting in the work to make my neighborhood, um, the Sacramento area, a more livable place. And I just want to say thank you to the Cleaner Air Partnership for creating a space for us to do so. And I'll hand the, back, the mic back over to you, Adrian. Thanks, Kathy. We're so excited to have you. <laughs> Um, so, so appreciate that. And then uh, to begin with something of, of an icebreaker for all of us, we do have a fun Zoom poll that I'm going to launch now. So please respond to this and we'll share our uh, share the results after. So we always do these fun Zoom polls. You should see it now on your screen. It's a would you rather question. Would you rather explore outer space or explore Earth's oceans? Two areas where Two areas that we don't know much about. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna, looks like most folks have participated. Five, four, three, two, one. And the poll, share the results. Rather close, 45 to 55, but uh, majority prefer Earth's oceans. I actually was, I was commenting to Kathy, I'd be, I'd be scared of being super far out in space. Uh, more so, more so than here, here on our, our blue marble, so. Good to know, 55 to 45, and hopefully, hopefully in our lifetime, we'll be able to do at 
was at least one of those things. <laughs> All right. So now let's dive into our subject matter for today, exploring how industry is advancing emissions reductions through corporate sustainability programs and outside of the regulatory frameworks that most of us are more familiar with. We have several experts who look forward to discussing this topic and answering your questions. Uh, and I'm just going to read off our list of panelists before turning it over to, to John. Um, but, but with us, we have Christopher Benjamin, who's Director of Corporate Sustainability at PG&E, Colleen McCormick, Sustainability Lead at SMUD, uh, both Debbie Wells and Corey Andrews. Debbie is Director of Government Affairs, Sustainability and Communications at CEMEX. And then Corey is Director of Sustainability and Public Affairs at CEMEX. And then John Lane, of course, is the Environmental Manager at Tyker. Uh, and current chair of the Clean Air Partnership. Um, so before we hear from this panel about their respective programs and get into the discussion with you all, I'd like to hand it off to uh, CAP Chair John Lane, who's going to share some important history and context to the corporate sustainability space. Go ahead, John. Well, thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I've learned over the last year that before we can talk about sustainability, we have to all kind of understand what it is. And so I, I've got a little PowerPoint here and I'm gonna try and run through in about 10 minutes and take everyone to really kind of create a, a benchmark of what sustainability is when we talk about corporate sustainability. And so let me know if, uh, can you see that, Adrian? Yes. Who's it? All right. And so one of, the, one of the first and most important questions is, let's see if I can make sure I can get this going. There we go. Is what, is what is sustainability? That question comes up right away. Uh, there's about 300 different definitions depending on uh, who you talk to. And so the reality is, is that when we talk about corporate sustainability, sustainability is really something that's shaped by a company's values uh, and uh, input from its stakeholders. And those stakeholders are investors, uh, the leadership of a company, their customers, employees, in a community and even more. Uh, the reality is, is when you put all that together, then a company can create what is actually a definition for sustainability. And if you just go on the internet, you'll find many, but here's a pretty basic one, which is, you know, a company with a sustainability program would be, you know, find it that it fulfills the needs of the current generations without compromising the needs of future generations while insurance about, ensuring a balance of economic growth, environmental care and social well-being being and the key there is, is that it's pretty broad based. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. It's not just environmental, which is what most people think of when we talk about sustainability. It really is also both um, social aspects of it and the governance or economic growth of a company. And so you'll see the term ESG tossed around quite a bit. So let me give you a little bit of context on sustainability, where it came from. Most people think of environmental, and that's really where it started in the 1970s uh, with the environmental movement. We had a lot of uh, interest in, uh, in things happening in the world, and uh, we started seeing things like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act. And then through 1980, we ended up seeing Superfund uh, came to be. We started first seeing, at that point, even in the 80s, the first time that sustainability uh, started thinking about social aspects through Nike. Uh, and their use of, of uh, labor practices um, in, in back in Asia. And then we also remember there was global uh, ozone. We also started seeing environmental policies from companies back in the 90s and EPA launching, launching Energy Star program, starting to look at energy and how its impacts on the world. And then as we get into 2000s, we start actually then start seeing sustainability about what are the products that, and what are our products doing to the world, whether they be animals and animal testing or diamonds, what are the true impacts of the diamond that you're wearing on your ring? And people started making decisions. Tuna is another good one. They were, we, you know, where, if you're having, eating a tuna fish sandwich, how is that tuna procured? And so people started voting with their wallets and companies took notice. And so we started seeing uh, companies like Walmart start, start looking at the big picture and, and many other companies, we started seeing, the, like in Rio Tinto, the chief executive officer um, uh, was ousted after there was uh, um, um, perceptions about how they were treating the indigenous peoples at that particular project. So what began is environmental stewardship, 
which really looked at focus and true environmental uh, projects and, and, and impacts really turned into also looking at people, workplace safety, equity, diversity, labor relations, communities, how, we, how we vol a company volunteered. And then today what we see too is, is that it's now shaping how business governs itself and including business to business relationships. So when we talk about sustainability now, we're really talking about these three pillars, which you'll, you'll hear that term three pillars, which are people, planet, and profits or prosperity. It just depends on who defines it for you. So what we find is, is that when you've come up with something so broad that the reality is, is that if a company has a sustainability program, it really can run a broad uh, gamut uh, running from really a, a relatively basic program to something that can actually be fully transformative for a company and everything in between. And I think that today's panel, you're going to see um, the, the, that we're really honored to have some people that are really up in the upper echelons of that. And it's really, I suspect we'll, they'll talk more about how their programs are more transformative. And so if we look at sustainability, corporate sustainability, the reality is, is that, like I say, they can be really a broad range of programs looking at different ways that they, they interact with their communities and stakeholders. So, you know, just as all three of these on the screen are vehicles, the, the Camry will get you from point A to point B, the F1 gets you there in a much different way than, a, than an X35. And all three of them require a lot of different uh, investments and coordination. So where's this pressure coming from? Uh, one place it's coming from, which isn't always intuitive, is it's coming from investors. And if we look at where people put their money, um, historically, they put their money where the returns were the best. But we're moving into a war where people also care, similar to what we were just talking about a second ago, is, is how that company makes its money. And so if we look at um, for example, BlackRock Investments, which currently manages somewhere around $25 trillion in investments, what, they're, what they have found when they, when they interview their, their investors, that 86% of them actually care about what, the sustainability of where their money goes, and they're making the decisions about where to put that money. So if you think about your 401ks, probably many of you now actually think about that of where, you know, where is your 401k money being? Uh, placed, and that's where it shows up on these graphs right here on the screen. So how does that end up reflecting within companies when they start adopting sustainability and looking at it? And we can look at one of our panelists, this is, pub, this is on their website, is that they actually have adopted sustainability in a pretty significant way. And one way to find that out is, is ask where is sustainability end up in, in the reporting within their, 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 their chain? And if you look here, you'll see that sustainability reports above the CEO. It, it's right up there with their finance committee and their audits. That, that's, that tells you that sustainability is pretty important to CEMEX, and I think we'll hear a little, little bit more about that. But this is pretty typical at anyone that's, that is adopting significant sustainability. This is not greenwashing. It's not something that's trivial. It's, it's actually reporting above the CEO, as you can see in this, this, um, this slide here. So, how does that work in business to business expectations? Well, here's, here's what it looks like if you're, a, uh, if you're a vendor to pg and &E. These are just a few of the pages of questionnaires that you get now if you wanna, do, if you wanna work for pg and &E as a contractor. Uh, and, and they wanna know, pg and &E wants to know pretty much everything about your environmental, your social, that whole broad gamut. There's a lot of questions here and they're actually scoring. Uh, and that means is that depending on your answer, will determine potentially uh, whether pg and &E is gonna do business with you. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that later. And so one of the key gamuts of sustainability is that it's actually transparent. So it means that you can't do this in a whole. Uh, you, you have to be able to show your work and show what you're doing uh, and not just in a trivial manner either. And we can see right now that if we just look at the S&P 500, 92% of the companies are now actually reporting on their sustainability. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And so, you know, transparency is a key hallmark of modern corporate sustainability. It's not just that you're doing it, but you're showing what you're doing and you're showing actual metrics. And so because you've got metrics, you also need to have standards. Otherwise, it's just greenwashing. And so there are multiple entities out there in the world that create sustainability standards. And so it, most companies, if you're doing anything that's, that's significant and more than just a check the box exercise, you're lining up with UN sustainability development goals, 
There's, they're, they're all lined up here with 17 different metrics. Those metrics all have a lot of detail between them. And if, you, and if you're using them, you're gonna to need to follow their standards. Another uh, entity that's out there developing standards is GRI or the Global Reporting Initiative. And again, if you're gonna if you're gonna line up with them and put your seal of uh, your seal on your um, sustainability report and say that you're using GRI, you have to follow their standards. And what that does, it creates accountability. It creates apples and apples when you're measuring across, and it really means that it's 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 actually something significant and not just checking the box. So a few themes. This these are the kinds of things going back to that ESG. You know, if you have a sustainability program, it's going to line up on themes. You don't have to choose all of them. You choose the ones that, uh, like I said before, that your stakeholders, your customers, your, your communities, your employees, what are the, what's important to them? And each one of those, if we look down the line, has a definition to it. And then if you go to those standards, like I mentioned, you'll find much more detail if you're going to use those as to how you're going to pull the data, what you're going to represent, if you're going to set goals, how are you going to report those goals? And so if we go through these, you'll see there's a lot here. Uh, and like I mentioned before, it's much more than just environmental. And, but there are, of course, environmental themes in any sustainability, um, significant sustainability effort. And probably the one that is most significant that we're going to talk a little bit about here today is greenhouse gas emissions. That is a, a staple of most sustainability programs. And the reason is it's pretty obvious. Uh, like I mentioned before, diamonds or whether you have cosmetics and there's impacts. Well, greenhouse gases affect the whole world. And so they've really taken center stage. And electric utilities and cement, those are two industries that have been you know, highlighted as having significant greenhouse gases. And so I think you'll see from our, our panelists that the work they're doing there is pretty significant. And, and we know that green, for example, SMUD alone is to, has uh, committed to go um, zero carbon by 2030. That's, that is an amazing goal, and it shows you how important that is to them. And so greenhouse gases, as we're going to hear from, I'm quite certain, is it's not just your own greenhouse gases, because greenhouse gases are also uh, associated with the energy you buy and produce, and then also other things like your commutes, you know, your, your employees, and anything else. There are three scoped emissions. And if you're going to tackle greenhouse gases, you're going to go have to reach out beyond your own uh, fence line. And so uh, in response to that, the electric utility industry has created an entire supply chain alliance because it's hard to tackle not just your own emissions, but outside that. So your supply chains become really critical. And we can see from this list, this is a national organization, but we see that, that SMUD, SoCal Edison, pg e they're all here in California and they're all on top of this. And if you look at what they say in their own mission statements, the mission of the Alliance is to push on supply chains and assess them, score them, gauge their performance, and then share that information. And so anyone who signed on to this, which all of our electric utilities here in California are, um, this means that it's, this shows you it's pretty significant, and we as Tykert, I can tell you, have felt the pressure from that, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But, and so, yeah, so actually one last slide here, and this just gives you an example. These are straight from SMUD, um, SoCal Edison, and, uh, and PG&E, and you can see that they're establishing their goals. If you're going to do work with them, you're going to, you're going to share information with them. Uh, and they're going to score you, and it's going to be relevant of whether or not you're going to do business with them. So with that, that is pretty much the 10-minute um, the or so version of sustainability. Hopefully that gets us all at least on, all on the same playing field to, to help make the, the following conversation um, a little bit more relevant. So I think that we should probably wait. There are probably a lot of questions, and I think the conversation between the panel will answer a bunch of them and create more. So I would suggest we wait till after the panel discussion to take questions. And Adrian, I'm gonna turn this back over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, that was a, a really rich presentation. And I think folks are really gonna want to uh, watch the recording and get a copy of, of your slides. Uh, and we'll certainly share that out um, I gotta later on. Figure out how to unshare here. There, I can help you, I think. Yeah, unshare me. Actually, you got to do it. Just uh, there should be a share screen button at the bottom. And, or no, and it's oh, there it is. It's on. There you go. Sorry, it's on a different screen. Yeah, but, but again, 
fantastic presentation and really look forward to hearing from you more about Tykert specifically. Um, again, we, we are recording this and, and I know I will be watching that again and we'll share a PDF of those slides in our follow-up email early next week uh, alongside the recording. Okay. Um, and I want, want, want to encourage folks to um, put questions that they have in the chat as they come about so that we can refer back to them for the, the coming uh, discussion. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Chris Benjamin with PG&E to explain a little bit more about PG&E's specific uh, corporate sustainability program. Chris. Sure, that, that sounds great. Hey, thanks so much, Adrian. And uh, I agree, John, that was a great, great overview. Uh, just happy to be with all of you this afternoon. As uh, I think Adrian mentioned, I uh, lead the uh, corporate sustainability team at, at PG&E. I think you're probably all familiar with PG&E utility operating here in California. And uh, I've been with the company for about you know, 15 or 16 years. So it was a little bit like a walk down memory lane <laughs> as you were walking through the timeline. Uh, in my role, um, probably similar to my, uh, my co-panelists, uh, lead a lot of sustainability initiatives for the company, uh, many of which relate to addressing climate change in one way or another, um, as well as the company's sustainability reporting and transparency efforts. So very familiar with a lot of the acronyms and alphabet soup, you know, John, that you were talking about between, you know, GRI and SASB and a number of other standard uh, reporting frameworks. Happy to get into that if folks are, are uh, if that's of interest. And then also uh, engaging our stakeholders uh, with a particular focus on uh, vulnerable uh, communities, our uh, tribal partners, environmental, social justice communities, things of, of that nature. And I would just say that, you know, we, uh, probably like the other panelists are experiencing and have experienced many of the trends that John referenced in his overview. When I joined PG&E, um, you know, we didn't have a sustainability program at this, this time. This is probably, you know, 15, 16 years ago. I joined in our environmental organization, our environmental policy group. And then, you know, that evolved into a sustainability function. And we use the frame of the triple bottom line, uh, which maps with one of the slides John showed, uh, people, planet, prosperity. And that's really how we think about sustainability is finding that right balance and, and really using that as a lens uh, for all of the work that we do. Uh, I, I would definitely characterize uh, sustainability for us as a journey. Um, it, it's something that it's sort of uh, through the lens of continuous improvement. You know, you're always trying to do better, always trying to find ways to better integrate that sustainability mindset, that triple bottom line, really into everything that you do as a company. And, you know, typically within organizations, there, there is a corporate sustainability team, but it's usually a small group of people. And so, you know, we partner extensively with teams throughout our organization, as well as a lot of external partners. And I think that's really key to uh, the success of any sustainability program is just finding those, those partnerships and, and really working, working together. You know, um, you know, I would say as we've been on our sustainability journey, uh, continue to, to make, make progress and our journey is, is heavily linked, I think, to California's longstanding leadership uh, around climate and clean energy. Um, you know, we, for example, our, our electricity last year was, was more than 90% uh, greenhouse gas emissions free. So that's been a huge focus for us over many years, as well as increasingly uh, focusing on adapting uh, to a change in climate. You know, climate change is real, it's happening. And, uh, you know, I think that's a challenge for, for all of us is to reduce emissions while while adapting to uh, extreme weather and a change in climate at the same time. Um, you know, recently, we, as part of our journey, announced a, a whole set of new uh, longer term climate goals for our company, something that I've been um, uh, very involved in here at the company and really exciting. You know, so for us, it includes a goal to be uh, net zero as a company by 2040, which is uh, five years ahead of the state of California, whose goal is carbon neutrality statewide by 2045. And then to actually go beyond that and be climate positive by 2050, where we'd actually be removing uh, more greenhouse gases uh, from the atmosphere than, than we uh, contribute. And um, uh, in the interim, we've set some specific goals 
around our scope one, two, and three emissions. John had that slide up earlier by 2030. So our goals are to reduce our scope one and two emissions, which is kind of our operational carbon footprint by 50% by 2030. And then our scope three, which largely for us is the electricity and natural gas that we supply to our customers by 25%, by 2030, by a uh, 2015 baseline. So that's a huge focus for us, working with all the teams and the action plans and things like that uh, to achieve those targets. And it's really fully integrated within our, our strategy, our business strategy as, as a company. Um, and I think just probably the last thing I would leave you with is, is that point of, of collaboration and partnership. You know, the issues, sustainability issues that we face as companies, as society, as communities, very complex. No one group, you know, can solve any of this alone. And I think the key is really finding ways to work together uh, and that includes our suppliers. So I uh, look forward to the discussion today and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris, for that overview. Um, so next up we have Colleen McCormick, who's the sustainability lead for SMUD. Great, thank you, Adrian. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Adrian and Kathy and, and John for uh, inviting SMUD and myself to be a part of this. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you all today. Uh, I joined SMUD as a sustainability lead in January of this year, so just uh, rounded out my fifth month and learning a lot. It's been fantastic. And uh, prior to joining SMUD, I was with the University of California, uh, most recently at UC News Health, where I led their sustainability efforts, and then prior to that at UC Merced. Um, so I'm excited to be at SMUD. I'm learning a lot about electric utilities and uh, was uh, really um passion to apply for my position because of the clean energy vision and the zero carbon plan. So I'm excited to uh, share more about that with you all today. Um, as many of you know, SMUD is committed to achieving environmental sustainability, stewardship, and compliance, and we're working hard to improve the quality of life throughout the Sacramento region. We have an ambitious goal to eliminate 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions from our power supply by 2030. As background, in July of 2020, SMUD's board of directors adopted a climate emergency declaration and asked staff to develop a plan to expedite carbon reductions due to the growing threats of climate change. This declaration led to the creation of our 2030 clean energy vision and our zero carbon plan. Our clean energy vision aims to deliver zero carbon emissions as its goal without compromising our world-class reliability or affordable rates. SMUD's goal to eliminate carbon emissions from our power supply by 2030 is more ambitious than already aggressive state mandates and is ahead of virtually all other utilities in the United States. Our 2030 zero carbon plan is a flexible roadmap to achieve our zero carbon goal while ensuring that all of our customers and communities that we serve reap the benefits of decarbonization. Coinciding with our 2030 clean energy vision and zero carbon plan, we've also developed our 2030 sustainable operations plan, which is focused on our internal operations, um, including greenhouse gas emissions reductions. It also has a focus uh, regarding green operations, uh, supply chain, biodiversity and habitat conservation, climate resiliency and engagement. This is a 10 year plan that contains a myriad of goals and tactics and is flexible and that we'll be updating this plan every year, excuse me, every three years. Paul Lau, our CEO, he continue, continually reviews and refines our overall direction based on input from the SMUD Board of Directors to guide us in the decisions we make about SMUD's policies and operations. Everything from our vision statement to related core values addresses aspects of sustainability. One of these is our Strategic Directive 7, Environmental leader Leadership, which is a core value of SMUD. And in achieving this directive, we're aiming to conduct our business affairs and operations in a sustainable manner by continuously improving pollution prevention, minimizing environmental impacts, conserving resources, and promoting equity within SMUD's diverse communities. We need to provide leadership and innovation to improve air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, promote the efficient use of energy by our customers, advance the electrification of vehicles, buildings, and equipment, and to also attract and build partnerships with customers, communities, policymakers, the private sector, and other stakeholders. 
And in closing, I'd like to also mention um, a fabulous sustainable communities initiative, which is helping to bring environmental equity and economic vitality to each and every community in our service territory. This community focused program aligns with SMUD's core purpose and vision to enhance the quality of life for all of our customers through innovative energy solutions. This program helps bring environmental equity and economic vitality to all communities in our service area and gives special attention to historically underserved neighborhoods. So thank you again for inviting me and I look forward to uh, continuing our discussion today. Thanks again. Thank you, Colleen. Next up, we have our friends from SAMEX, uh, Debbie Wells and Corey Andrews are gonna tag team. Go for it. We are. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us uh, and join you today. So many of you may know us, some of you may not. Uh, so I'll just kind of do a brief overview of who we are. Uh, Semex is a global publicly traded company specializing in the manufacture of cement, ready mix concrete and aggregates. We're proud to be an industry leader uh, with an industry leader with our sustainability initiatives uh, and commitments to carbon, to reducing carbon emissions globally and a commitment to get to a net zero concrete by 2045. Semex also believes that climate change is one of the biggest challenges of our time and supports the urgency of collective action. And uh, John, uh, you've already pointed out kind of our, you know, uh, uh, how important sustainability is with our the little graphic there. Um, but it, sustainability and climate change has been a priority for Semex for many, many years. And we've made significant progress to date. In fact, uh, Semex has actually signed the Paris Agreement as well. And then I wanted to just add really quickly before I turn it over to Corey to talk about some of our specific actions. Uh, we as an industry in California, the cement industry in California, worked, uh, created a what we call a carbon neutrality roadmap uh, specific to cement production in California. And that is available. I'm happy to share that with anybody who'd like to see it. Uh, and we worked very closely with Senator Becker's office last year, uh, helping uh, draft the language in SB 596 that uh, would, that require, that's legislation that requires benchmarks for carbon reduction in cement production uh, over the next 30 years with ideally getting to a, a net zero uh, production by 2045. And very proud to say that that bill was signed by the governor last year. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Corey, my colleague, uh, and she can talk about some of our uh, specific initiatives in sustainability. Corey? Yeah, thanks, Debbie. So my name is Corey Andres. I'm the Director of Sustainability and Public Affairs for CIMEX. Um, like Colleen, I've been in this position for about six months, so I'm still learning our sustainability um, initiatives. We have a bunch of them, um, but I'll definitely be able to give you guys a high level overview. Um, I came from our environmental department, so sustainability at CEMEX is not completely new to me. Um, so like Debbie said, we're a global company, and um, our a lot of our sustainability initiatives are global. I focus on the U.S. component of sustainability and then Debbie, while she works on the U.S. component, she primarily focuses on California and Arizona so she can answer questions specific to California for you guys. But our sustainability program encompasses a lot of the areas that John talked about in the introduction presentation. But when we prioritize our sustainability program, our, our probably biggest focus is what's called our Future in Action initiative, our Future in Action Roadmap, which both Debbie and I have our, our backgrounds with Future in Action behind us. Uh, it's our logo. Um, so what Future in Action is, is like I said, a roadmap. Um, it's focused on developing low carbon products, solutions and processes to make us become a net zero CO2 company. We have specific, specific levers and plans with timelines associated with those levers and carbon reductions associated with each one of those levers. Um, these range from anything from um, 
um, increasing the use of alternative fuels to improving our energy usage, um, advancing the circular economy, which that's kind of a new term that's come up in recent years, and I'll be glad to talk about that later. And then even tweaking the way that we make some of our products. So um, if you want to know more about our reporting, I'm glad to talk about that too, but mainly wanted to focus on our future in action roadmap today. Um, so just you know, ask me questions about that if you if you want to. Um, and you, I'm glad to talk about that during the QA session. So thanks for having me. Thank you. I might add, and I, I'm sorry, Adrian. I was just going to add, and uh, Corey uh, can put this in the chat later if because I may have to jump off early. But um, anybody who wants to learn about our future in action or our sustainability initiatives can go to the CEMEX USA website and look under the sustainability tab, and you'll find probably more information than you care to read through. But that's a, it's a good resource. Yeah. Thanks for that. Well, thanks, Corey. Thanks, Debbie, for uh, for that overview. And then last but not least, uh, John Lane, Environmental Manager with Tiker. Tell us a little bit more about what Tiker's doing. Well, um, so first, for those who don't know, let me give just a quick introduction to Tiker. So Tiker, it, importantly, is privately owned. So we're still owned and, and operated by the Tiker family. So we don't necessarily uh, rely on Wall Street or outside investors, which is important here in the context of this. And I'll make that clear in a second. We're also California's oldest contractor from 1887. We're contractor number eight. We're all over the state of California. We've got 30 locations in both California and Nevada. We have sand and gravel mines and processing asphalt plants, ready mix facilities. Um, and so we also, and we have construction services. We build things for people and that's where most people know us from. We do solar, we have land development arm. We also do habitat restoration and importantly, we also have the Tiger Foundation, which is really involved in our communities and nonprofits and supporting them in the community. So we've been doing good things for a really long time. And because we're private, um, we've always felt like we really didn't have to tell anybody about it. We were doing it because we wanted to. Now, our relationship with, with the pa other panelists is Semex is a very good customer of ours. So we supply sand and gravel to Semex facilities. Um, and we also have business ventures with them. They're, they're super good partners to us. PG&E, we, we have an electric utility solar group and PG&E is a significant client of ours. So we want to do work for PG&E. And then SMUD, we have a longstanding uh, relationship with SMUD as partnerships and projects. And so where are we in sustainability? I, I got to point back to, to the, the supply chain stuff. Uh, so, for example, Semex to support their role and the and the goals that they want. The more um, the more improvements we make to our products, Semex can take can take advantage of that. So, Semex wants to know what are the life cycles of our products, how much energy we use, how do we produce our products, and that information then supports Semex's sustainability. Same thing for PG&E. PG&E, I showed you those. The, there were three charts. There were lots and lots of questions. That's very typical nowadays. Our, uh, when, when we want to do business with somebody like pg and &E, they want to know everything about us and they're going to score us on that. And the ability to, to get contracts with them relies on how good you're doing at all those things. So, and then the same thing with SMUD. So our sustainability is really, we've been working hard at it for the last year. We've been doing good things forever, but because we're a private company, never, we never felt the, that we had to really share it with anybody because we didn't have to. But now we recognize through our partner sustainability programs that if we can't share it, then, then ultimately we're being evaluated on, on, on what can't be known. So we, for the last year, have been working hard at Tykert to take what we do and, and allow it to be transparent so, it, it, so that people, like our, our partners and the people in the public can see what we do, then they also start responding to those um, the greenhouse gas emissions. So for example, at least one of the panelists that's here, they will force us to start reporting our greenhouse gases to them to next year. And that's pretty significant. When you've got one business telling another, we want to, you're going to have to tell us about yourself. And we want to, in, in fact, know data about you so that we can measure and, and, and grade you on your performance. That's really, that's a, that's a fundamental change in business. And that's what I hope that we get a chance to really talk about. This is really different 
than anything we've ever experienced. We as the collective, we, you have regulators who are out pushing on things, but we are also seeing business pushing the envelope on each other for that collective goal of trying to, you know, make a difference in the world. So, so on sustainability on our side, there's a, we, you can go on our website and it says sustainability and it's got some good things there, but, but you'll see in the next six months, we are responding uh, to our, to those, uh, the, my fellow panelists and others that are expecting to see more from us. So, uh, and I think it's a good thing. Uh, we're, we're excited over here at Tiger to respond and, uh, and develop our sustainability program. So with that, I'll jump off of that and let's um, have a discussion. And Adrian, back to you. Thanks, John, and thanks all to, uh, to all of our panelists. And want to remind folks if you do have questions for I got I got a whole bunch, but I want to make sure that we're elevating questions from you all um, for for any number of our panelists. Um, so so I'll start off then. Uh, I know we have one, at least one in the chat. Um, but thinking about supply chain, you know, we talked we talked a bit about the respective companies and the programs overall, but thinking about each of our supply chains or each of your supply chains. How does that factor into the corporate sustainability framework for each of your organizations? And I don't know who'd like to take that first. Chris. Adrian, I'm happy to kick it off. And I think John, you set us up well as a supplier, you know, of PG&E. Um, it's really important. And, you know, I think uh, we think about our suppliers really as partners, you know, they're kind of an extension of our workforce. And so in a lot of different ways, um, work to uh, try to make sure our suppliers are aware of, of the expectations, but then to help help them, you know, kind of um, uh, in their own, you know, journey, whatever that may, may be, but particularly as it relates to sustainability. And so we actually started a program way back in, in 2007, focusing on how to build a more uh, sustainable supply chain. And um, it's, I'd say it's evolved, you know, over the years, uh, but there, um, you know, so there's a, there are dedicated staff uh, within our supply chain organization that are focused on this, that I have the privilege of, of, of working with. And it, it uh, shows up in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is, as John mentioned, kind of in the RFP process, the selection process. So we are very interested in learning from uh, potential suppliers about, you know, their work uh, in, in, in this area. It can help, to John's point, improve the scoring and the assessment of, of potential suppliers. And then when you become a, a supplier of, of PG&E, uh, there's a variety of different ways that we uh, just kind of monitor uh, that, that performance and help, help support su our suppliers. For example, we offer uh, greenhouse gas emissions training for our suppliers, knowing that you know, our suppliers come in all different sizes and, and this may be a new, new area. And so we wanna help uh, with, with training, with, with coaching. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that we have uh, put in place a number of years ago through that supply chain alliance that, that we helped co-found with another number of other utilities is an annual uh, survey. And we realized that uh, as utilities, we share a lot of suppliers. And so, you know, instead of PG&E having a sur survey, SMUD having a survey, SoCal Edison having a survey, we've sort of banded together. So it's one survey that, that goes out and, and it's an opportunity for our suppliers to share uh, their goals, their, their progress around, um, you know, energy, water, waste, environmental compliance, and, and we use the results of that and track the results of that and set goals around the results of that to help us understand, you know, where our suppliers are in, in their journey. And one of the things that we've done more recently is to really uh, look at our supply chain through the lens of greenhouse gas emissions. And, um, and so what we've done is a, uh, we call it a hotspot assessment, but essentially look at, you know, where, where are the greenhouse gas emissions in our supply chain? And that helps us target our efforts because we've got, you know, over 4,500 suppliers and it's just, how do you focus your efforts? And, and so that has led us to where we are today to, to really focus on partnering and working with, you know, suppliers in our, in our construction, vegetation management, manufacturing, you know, those parts of our supply chain to, to help um, uh, support uh, in developing, you know, their own goals because back to John's earlier 
slide, you know, our suppliers, that's, that's, they're part of pg and scope three emissions. And so anything we do to, to help our suppliers reduce their emissions, that helps our overall uh, footprint. And I, I would just say it's, um, you know, continues to be a work in progress, but it's helpful to partner with, with other utilities from across our sector so that we can, um, you know, learn from one another and uh, develop standards and best practices that, um, you know, continue to, to move the ball forward. Thanks, Chris. Any other panelists want to speak to the, the supply chain question, how it factors into their sustainability programs? I can, Adrian. Um, I think SMAD, we're really tapping in and utilizing our membership in USCA. Uh, that's really helping to drive sustainability across SMUD and bring more employees into, into the fold. Um, it's really um, helping to inform uh, our supply chain team to assess and develop a roadmap. Um, and, and also it's, it's been um, key in terms of bringing in employees from our procurement team and our warehouse team as well. So again, just um, you know, do more outreach to folks and, and getting more folks across the organization involved has been really helpful. And then uh, we've been utilizing um, a tool of US because they call the Sustainability Project or TSP. It's a supplier survey tool. Um, it's designed to educate suppliers on environmental best practices and also benchmarking. Um, their progress is what's been mentioned before. So, um, so that's been really helpful with, you know, with helping us identify our top suppliers. Um, and then in addition to that, um, again, with influence um, from that partnership and membership in UISCA at SMUD, we're working now to draft a supplier code of conduct that we're anticipating having that go live next year. Um, and we're also undertaking efforts to increase our supplier participation in TSP. And then um, RFPs was mentioned earlier from Chris, and I'll just add that um, we do weight um, environmental criteria at 2% in our RFPs um, generally, although recently we've had a couple of opportunities to increase that to 5% with um, an RFP related to custodial services as well as sustainability consultant services. So, um, so there's definitely, uh, it's definitely important um, across our, our supply chain endeavors. Corey? Yeah, I can talk about this, although my, um, my answer is going to be probably, well, it is very different than the other two panelists. Um, so uh, scope three emissions are important to us, but they're a, a smaller part of our CO2 roadmap than our scope one and scope two emissions. So we've primarily focused on scope one and scope two, um, meaning how we make our product, especially at our cement plants. And one of the levers that I mentioned that we are working through um, trying to increase alternative fuels. Um, so the alternative, the supply chains for alternative fuels are much less developed than the supply chains associated with, you know, more traditional fuels like fossil fuels. And so that's something that we are having to work through um, pretty much on a daily basis. I feel like I'm in, in very frequent meetings regarding alternative fuels, how to secure more alternative fuels and how to get them to our plants and into our kilns. Thank you. All I right. guess I can I can round that out on the on the on the supply chain side. We're in the supply chain of all the other panelists, and I would highly recommend that that people go on to each of their websites and pull up their sustainability reports, and it'll answer a ton of questions about how much meat is there. But on the on the receiving side of this, I can tell you that, and Chris mentioned earlier the education, and and we have been a beneficiary of that, and I know that Smud and probably Semex does the same thing. Is, is that your goal is not to just hammer your supply chains because that doesn't do you any good, but to ultimately give them goalposts and then help them get there. And so as part of that kind of work, we've been getting ourselves to the, you know, to a point where we'll have a formal sustainability program that we would hope would be, you know, at, at a bare minimum F1 level. But, and part of that then is that we start looking at our own ch supply chain. So really it's, it really rolls downhill. So 
it, in looking at our supply chains, we are doing the same thing now. And, that, and remember, that's broad and diverse, not just greenhouse gases, but diversity, equity, equity. We talk about you know supply chains and, and and codes of conduct, those kinds of things. So we're looking downward in all, the people that we work with now, lifting them up and bringing them along. And in the same time, then that can help our you know the SEMXs and the PGEs and SMUD and the, all the other people that we work with. It's just it's a, you know sustainability is really is a village and it is happening significantly. And that's again that's what I hope the take home is here. Thank you. I'm going to go back to a, a question from earlier from uh, Richard with United Latinos. Uh, prop, it looks like it's primarily directed at our utility partners, but just interested in how solar buybacks uh, might factor into corporate sustainability planning. I don't know if Colleen or Chris wants uh, is, is able to answer that. I would say, Adrian, at this point, it's it's outside of my scope of knowledge. Being five months in at SMUD, um, my supervisor, Emily Bikini, put in uh, some comments within chat with a link to our buyback program. But um, I'm happy to take Richard's contact information and, and circle back to him um, with further information. Great. And I would say the same. Uh, the uh, I think the flip side of that is just that, you know, rooftop solar just has continued to flourish here in California. You know, I think we've got over 600,000 customers interconnected to the grid uh, with, with uh, solar rooftops. So it just continues to be a, um, you know, huge, huge area of, of growth. Um, the, I think the, the one thing I would say is that um, the uh, one area of increasing focus for us as as utilities, and I think I've seen a little bit in the chat over on the right as well, is just the recognition of the opportunities within the transportation sector. Um, you know, the electricity in, in California, we're very fortunate, is, is very clean because of many, many years <clears throat> of, uh, of work in that area. And, and I think that's, that's gonna be a big opportunity for the state is uh, currently it's about 40% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. So as we, really move towards um, unleashing the full potential of electric vehicles. Just so many co-benefits in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, reducing air emissions. And uh, one of the things that we're excited about too is, is the opportunities for electric vehicles to serve as a, a grid uh, resilience resource. Um, and so I, I think that will be an important next uh, frontier and uh, not only in terms of helping uh, with the proliferation of these vehicles across, not just on the light duty space, but medium and heavy duty space for, for many of the um, you know, commercial partners in California, um, but uh, you know, just finding ways to just think differently about how they can be integrated into the, the grid itself. Thanks, Chris. So here, here's another question. Um, Kind of about the relationship between regul basically regulation and then some of this more business, you know, business to business uh, driven um, um, activity. Where do regulatory pressures play a role in these corporate sustainability plans? If or or do they not play a role, or is this, is this entirely independent of regulation? And I see Chris, you're on mute. You know, just maybe a couple thoughts on that. Uh, you know, I think. They, they play a really, really important role, particularly here in the state of California, because the state has such a, a strong climate, uh, clean energy, and, and even in the social side, such a strong focus. It, um, uh, for, for anyone, you know, working or living in the state of California, it has a, has a huge influence, particularly for, for utilities. So as I mentioned earlier, I mean, California as a state has a goal for the entire economy to be carbon neutral by 2045, which sounds far off, but it's actually not that far off in the future. And so there's a tremendous amount that is already happening and will happen uh, to help transform uh, you know, how we use energy, the cars we drive, the homes that we live in. And uh, for me, I think that's, that's really exciting. I think it has a, uh, uh, you know, significant implications, but as businesses and, uh, I think there's an opportunity for us to then say, okay, that, that's what the, the regulatory timeline is. Those are the regulatory goalposts. You know, 
what can what's our role where can we uh, accelerate uh, how can we help to innovate kind of to john's point earlier you, you set sort of the guideposts but then uh, there's great opportunities to to work within that particularly with an eye towards uh, you know, equity and uh, having equitable, uh, affordable, uh, you know, solutions. And so um, I, I guess that's how I think about it. Great. Uh, Adrian, I'll add into this question as well. I think um, the regulatory climate has huge influence on on how we're uh, creating our climate action goals and, and, and you know, creating opportunities and and idea you know being innovative in our ideas on how to get there and you know one of the challenges you know a company like ours does face is there's the goalposts as uh he was just saying but there's not a lot of um uh of of uh, description on how to get there if you will and so you know, we we have these goals for our industry to, in, in, as a company and as an industry, to be you know reducing our carbon emissions through our operations, you know, by 2030, by 2035, by 2045. But we also need help from the regulatory community and the legislative community because there it, it, it's not as simple as saying, oh, reduce your emissions uh, in your operations. We need other factors to come into play to keep it to get to that net zero. And and Corey mentioned it before: the use of alternative fuels. You know, let's 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 increase all the use of alternative fuels to uh, to use in our cement production. And alternative fuels could be tires, it could be agriculture waste. It's certainly it could be a, a solid waste. You know, you're run of the mill garbage, rather than it going to a landfill, it can come out to our cement facility and we can use it as a fuel to burn our kilns. Um, you know, we're utilizing renewable diesels and, and CNG uh, uh, fuel in our, in our ready mix truck. Um, so, you know, that regulatory community is going to be a play a big factor on how our industry can actually achieve it. We need their help. We need to collaborate together on what that what the rules and regulations need to look like so we can be successful in getting there. Thanks, Debbie. Any other comments before we move on to our next question? I, I was just gonna, you know, it's it's you know interesting here. So the panelists, um, they're they're heavily regulated industries, whereas where Tikert sits below that. So we feel the we certainly feel regulation and legislation through in you know, many forms, whether it be you know climate action plans or CEQA, wolf-based greenhouse mitigation plans through projects, certain legislation. But for the most part, we're we're feeling it in a different way, and that is again through sustainability and supply chain. So on one hand, we have to meet the regulation, but then there is the very challenging goals that that our, you know, our supply chains are putting out there and we're trying to support them. So through life cycle assessments, for example, how do we make our product? What fuels do we use? And then those ultimately will, will can be folded into what's called an EPD, an environmental product declaration. And then that then uh, can be utilized by those purchasing our products to determine and compare them against other products to what's the total carbon footprint or environmental footprint on that product. And so that goes all the way from cradle to gate. And so that's how the regulations are one hand uh, pushing us, but, but at the same time, so are the sustainability needs of our, uh, of our customers and, and, and clients. John. If I could just add to what, what John was just saying, Adrian, really quick, that life cycle assessment is key in that net zero scenario as well, looking from, from that from cradle to grave, looking at a product's not only from the manufacturing, but the the use cycle and then the recycle of that product uh, uh, has to be considered uh, also. And that's where that collaboration with the regulatory um, framework will be really uh, helpful um, for industries such as ours to get to that net zero. Thank you. So we have a good question here from the board president of SMUD, and I'm wondering if, if Mr. Brandon Rose wants to unmute to, to ask his question. Um, and if not, I can ask it. But 
Brandon, uh, you asked a really good question about concrete. I did. I I did ask a question. Um, I was actually sitting here reading the CMEX sustainability plan on their website, which goes through the details and the specific numbers, which is great. But I was just asking about that. Were there midpoints between now and the 2045 carbon neutrality slash net zero goal? Uh, and are there any sort of specific technologies being developed to help decarbonize concrete production, which is, which is, which is a major source at a point in time? But what was just said is very true as well from a life cycle assessment and you you put that over a hundred years, it's much lower compared to burning fuel in your car. Well, it, it, and you'll see on our website and I don't have it in, in front of me, so I don't know the exact numbers and details, but we do have commitments to reduce our carbon emissions uh, by 2030 uh, from 1990 levels by like an additional 30% uh, from what we've done to date. Uh, so I don't have those in front of me, so I apologize. I can pull up the website and get back to you but, um, and some of our, our papers. Um, but I think a lot of that data is shown uh, under our sustainability page uh, on the CEMEX USA website. And then your second question is probably going to take a lot longer than an hour <laughs> to really go into decarbonization of cement. I kind of touched on it earlier. Um, and, you know, we're looking at all kinds of things. We're very active uh, uh, and we invest in, in innovative companies that uh, help us, you know, come up with new ideas to look at different ways that we can, you know, decarbonize uh, our cement processes, but alternative fuels is one of them. Um, heat recovery is another. I mean, there's a, there's a whole gamut of... of actions, yeah, thank you, that need to come together to help us get to that net zero. Uh, and there's lots of really great innovative ideas floating around there. Tori, do you want to add something to what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, there are technologies that we're um, employing. We have hundreds of projects going on at our eight cement plants across the country right now. Um, but some other projects that we're working on are, are hydrogen injection projects, carbon capture, um, other kiln technology. So, I mean, there's just a wide variety of things that we're doing. Um, it's very well planned out um, with specific reductions associated with each project um, that we're, we're targeting. So, um, it, it's not just pie in the sky. We we really do have a a, a plan to implement. And wouldn't that wouldn't that be demonstrated in the uh, at least to some degree in your uh, sustainability report, your annual sustainability reports? Yes. I mean that's that that's yes. kind of the difference here. Is just that in the past you might hear statements about what a company is gonna do, but sustainability, if a core of it is transparency. And, and so that is very different. And so again, I, I recommend looking at sustainability reports of any of our panelists or, or any company you're interested in, because those haven't been there before, uh, before, you know, if we can look too far back. Yeah, thank you, John. And we have a very robust sustainability report we put out annually, and you can find that on our website as well. If, if I could just add one one thing to that in terms of the evolution, uh, you know, for for sustainability reporting, the, the GRI you mentioned, John, as kind of the key framework for that, that many companies have been doing. There's also, I'd say, with, with just the increasing focus on climate, climate risk, whether that's from investors or others, there's been, um, a, I think, a focus on issuing a climate specific uh, report and the framework for that, the, the acronym is TCFD and that stands for the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And um, so uh, I, I think Adrian, you had put the link over on the right hand side. Uh, when we announced our, our climate goals, we, uh, we actually issued a, a standalone climate strategy report that talks about the goals and the governance and, and uses that framework. And interestingly, some of you would mentioned sort of the regulatory uh, drivers, pretty significant that uh, the US Securities and Exchange Commission recently proposed rules, climate disclosure rules for companies uh, to disclose on, on climate, how you're managing climate change, you know, uh, goals you've set, 
things of that nature in your 10K. And so that um, was just put out for public comment. Uh, yeah, we were we we submitted a, a letter uh, comment, generally supporting the rules, but providing some some feedback, as have many others. And so I think that's just something to watch. That what has been for many years voluntary, uh, you know, climate reporting, climate disclosure, is gaining increasing tr traction in the regulatory arena, just because the um, you know the risks and the opportunities associated with climate change. Are so important, and, um, and I think that's just a signal or a sign, if you will, of this convergence. You know that that's happening. I could dovetail off of that a little bit too, Chris, in terms of, of reporting and a bit of the alphabet soup of reporting. Uh, SMUD participates in CDP. This will be our fifth year responding to that, um, and, and we uh, really welcome and, and appreciate having that opportunity to disclose you know, our greenhouse gas emissions through that, that global um, disclosure tool. Uh, and, and last year received an A minus in that and the year prior an A. So we're really proud of that success and want to continue that momentum and, and keep building on that. Um, the other thing we're doing at SMUD is we're also exploring the science-based target initiative, which John, I think you had on one of your introductory slides. Um, and that's a goal setting framework um, that provides clearly defined path to reduce emissions in line with climate science. Um, so we're really considering um, pursuing that as well. And then also um, earlier this year, SMUD was recognized from JD Power um, as a power certified sustainability leader. So it's the first time we received that designation. Um, and, um, and it was in recognition of our customer service and our vision for a carbon free power supply by 2030. And then um, lastly, I'll just say that um, SMUD puts out a public facing sustainability report. We do it every other year um, and it's available. Oh, thank you, Kathy, for putting it on. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so we have a, a question from Becky Wood in the chat, uh, and it's been referenced by a few of you about a circular economy. And I know I'm looking at Heidi Sanborn. This is her day job. Uh, so I'm kind of curious about, about uh, how you define a circular economy in terms of your own company and your sustainability plan. What does it look, what could it look like for you um, in terms of corporate sustainability? You want that from any, any of us? Any of you. Well, I, I mentioned life cycle assessments uh, and, and EPDs. That's a term, if you haven't heard it before, you're gonna hear about it. There were, there, I think there were at least 10 bills in this last legislature in California that focused on EPDs alone or life cycle assessments. So back to Becky's point, if we produce a product at Tykert, for example, whether it be asphalt or ready mix or, or rock, um, it, it takes energy to mine it. it there's, there's an impact to mining. It takes energy to process it. It takes, uh, you know, there, there's the, the process itself. And so the, a life cycle assessment takes that. And, me, and I think I'm answering the question. It takes all that energy, whether we're purchasing it or we're burning it or whatever. And that then captures all of that so that then it can be then further utilized by whoever we sell it to if they're going to make a building, for example, they'll, they'll be able to take the, the, all the energy and the impacts that we have. Then there's the operational, the building of the building, and then ultimately to the grave of that building when it's demolished and comes back to us and recycle and captures all of that so that you get the cradle to grave net impact of that circular economy. Did I answer that question? Anybody else want to elaborate on that? Kind of makes me curious about what building recycling looks like, but maybe that's a conversation for another time. It looks like Chris on here. Yeah, the only thing I was going to add is it's definitely an emerging uh, topic. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the organization Green Biz that uh, hosts a lot of just great events, and um, so they there is a dedicated conference um, uh, around the circular economy. You know, there's been a lot of uh, focus on it within the consumer products industry um, and thinking about opportunities to have sort of that closed loop system. I think that's kind of the holy grail where the waste products become the end, pot, end product. And so you're, you're, um, you're just reducing waste, uh, but also, but just thinking more about the, um, uh, you know, the overall systems. And, and so I would just, just note that if that's of interest, you take a look at that, that event. And I think there's lots of examples of companies who are are leading that, and you know, for 
for us, you know, all, all of the recycling, I think that, that we do is, is probably foundational to that. You know, with utilities, we have uh, investment recovery groups, you know, where we're taking used, you know, meters and various equipment and, uh, and recycling all of that. And it, it, um, it, you know, one of the things about the circular economy and these kinds of systems is it, it not only provides environmental benefits, but it's often more cost effective uh, to look at that. Uh, but I would say within our supply chain, definitely something that we're interested in. And if suppliers of ours are, are finding ways to um, you know close the loop, that would just sort of add to their the value, if you will, because and, and that's the kind of thing that we would want to know about and and learn about and help to uh, to share because it's ultimately sustainability if you can remove remove waste from from the various uh, you know products and uh, systems that we're all using. Yeah, I'll, I'll add. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll add for for Smud. This is definitely an area that we're interested in exploring, and and our procurement team um, is is uh, working on this along with our suppliers. Um, and we have a colleague in our warehouse who's been particularly a champion in terms of reclaiming um, metals and other items um, as our our field crews come back in from the day and and repurposing those when we can, um, certainly recycling the metals when we cannot um, repurpose them, but um, also uh, has been working diligently with a vendor um, with regards to the wood reels that contain the cabling, those huge giant wood reels that have been going um, into the landfill, working on a program to um, have the vendor take those back and reuse those. So some success is being made, but there's still a lot of opportunity in the circular economy space. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, so the circu circularity is a pillar of our future in action uh, program, our roadmap. So it's really important to us. And we kind of see it as, as a multitude of different things. We've talked a lot about our, our alternative fuels program, and that's a big portion of the circular economy um, focus that we have. Um, just getting waste and using it as a fuel in our kiln is, is a great great way to use that waste. Um, we can also use it as a raw material in some cases. So there are some raw materials that we use that can, um, that can um, contribute to the uh, circular economy. We also can um, recycle some of our products. So we recycle concrete and, and aggregates um, back into our processes. Um, so those are all ways that we, we focus on the circular economy. We're looking at more ways, ways to, to do that. Thank you. All right, well, looks like we have time for just about one more question. Um, what are other examples? So we've talked about, you know, this is really happening largely outside of regulation. Um, it's, it's investors, it's others. It's businesses pushing other businesses to adopt some of these ambitious goals. What are some other kind of interesting examples that you, you suggest we check out of businesses like pushing each other on this stuff? Any other just examples that maybe haven't been mentioned? You know, maybe just one category that we haven't focused on as much, but I think is there's going to be a lot of innovation, a lot of collaboration. And that has to do with just adapting to climate change. You know, uh, it's it's something that's going to affect everyone. And um, just as an example of that, um, you know, we recently applied for a grant uh, from FEMA, along with the, the city of Menlo Park, uh, Meta, formerly Facebook, and some others, for funding to build a um, a nature-based solution. Uh, uh, seawall around the San Francisco Bay that would not only protect our electric infrastructure, but uh, disadvantaged community and others. And we're really excited about it because, it, it, you know, to protect against the risk of sea level rise. It's a, um, I think it's just a recognition that if we pool our resources and combine, uh, you know, our, our together, uh, you, you know, one project can actually benefit multiple groups and and if everybody chips in it's more affordable that way and so 
I would just maybe flag that as a as an area as we think about uh, just adapting to to the various uh, climate risks, ways in which that we can kind of band together and find uh, community scale solutions. It'll um, I think it'll just serve us all well. Thank you. Other examples. I guess one thing I can think of, and, and actually it was last night uh, at the at uh, SMUD's presentation for uh, its uh, its goals, its 2030 goals, and another presentation I heard the week before from the asphalt industry is you know asphalt currently it's it takes a ton of energy to, to produce asphalt, and right now it's natural gas. So when, for us in the nat in the asphalt industry to go to zero carbon or net carbon. We really need technology and other fuel sources to come to play before we can do anything. And it's just, you know, interesting to hear the work being done by the, the manufacturers of the asphalt plants to potentially move toward hydrogen and then also SMUD and others talking about bringing those kinds of technologies to us. So there's the partnerships. You know, one really good example in our industry is you've got industry being able to, to do R&D to produce a plant that can use an alternative energy and then our other partners making sure that that can be brought to us and have the logistics to bring it there so that we can then ultimately, you know, set a goal uh, that we can achieve. Thank you. Semex or SMUD, any, any thoughts on just other examples of, you know, uh, corporate sustainability businesses pushing businesses to, um, to adopt some of these ambitious goals? Well, it might be a bit, uh, Adrian, of reiterating other points that have been made, but but I've always felt that working in the sustainability space and, and you know addressing climate crisis, which is the crisis of our lifetimes, we can't do this you know individually in a vacuum. We have to work collaboratively. We have to be transparent. You know, set those those benchmarks and and continue to report out on progress and just continue, you know, to push each other um, to to develop solutions, you know, for these, these, um, these challenges that we're facing. Um, and and it's, it's really a big part of the reason why I'm in California. I'm originally from Indiana and just felt that progress on climate change was quite stagnant there. And I really wanted to be somewhere where I could work on this really aggressively. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm grateful to be in California where we have these regulatory requirements that are pushing us and, um, and you know, we're always pushing and, and looking forward at SMUD. And so I'm again, grateful to be at SMUD um, and have such uh, such visionary leadership um, and commitment, you know, to addressing, addressing this, you know, dire challenge for future generations in particular um, and those that are, are um, you know, under-resourced and more challenged, so. That's maybe a, a broad answer there, Adrian. But those are that's kind of my approach. How I how I take my you know approach my work and things that I think about on a frequent basis. So, thank you, Semex. Any thoughts? Um, I would just kind of echo what everybody else said, but also um, you know we're a global company, so we take a lot of our initiatives. Um, you know, I talk with my European colleagues almost on a daily basis to find out what they're doing and what's happening in Europe and the regulations that the EU are passing. So, um, you know, that's, in fact, yesterday I was talking to them about um, something called taxonomy, I think is what it's called. It has to do with um, like bonding capabilities and financial um, financial mechanisms for sustainable sustainable projects. Thank you. So. Very cool. Well, this is a really good conversation. I just learned a ton about what's happening largely outside of what we what many of us kind of work within and advocate around. Um, John, as, as chair of the Clean Air Partnership, do you have any just final, uh, you know, giving you the last word here, but any final comments just to kind of contextualize things uh, and, and bring us full circle to what you were, uh, what you introduced us to at the beginning of this meeting? And then we'll close it. <laughs> I, would, I would just say that hopefully what, what it's clear is, is that um, through sustainable programs and, and the transparency there, that, that many in business are setting really, really ambitious goals 
And so, you know, for, for example, uh, Director Rose's question about how would CEMEX get there, it's no different than SMUD's and super ambitious goal and 2030 goal. It's the goals that establish the, the you know, essentially the, 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 the finish line and it forces then companies to move toward the getting there. And so that's an ongoing iterative process. And, and it's pushing everybody within the company and within their supply chains and really connecting us from a business standpoint to, to reach environmental, social, and other goals that, that, that's really very different than what we've seen in the past. Thank you. Well, everyone, uh, I just wanna thank you for participating in today's very insightful conversation. We're not quite done yet, um, but huge thank you to Valley Vision's Kathy Seichu, who did an excellent job of managing the back-end operation and keeping things running smoothly. Y'all can thank Kathy in the chat. Um, and thanks, of course, to our fantastic lineup of experts and to the Cleaner Air Partnerships generous contributors for sponsoring this virtual luncheon. So we actually have one more poll for you all, and it's related to the next time that we all get together. Um, and I'm gonna launch this right now. So you should be seeing a pop-up about your current preferences for in-person meetings or the possibility of in-person meetings uh, when we do our next Clean Air Partnership Lunch. So hopefully folks are seeing that option. Um, so yes, you meet without masks. Yes, with masks required. Meet outdoors. No, not, not quite ready. Or something else that you can put in the chat. I'm going to give you another 10 seconds, another five seconds, four, three, two, one, and then share the results. Okay, so it looks like folks are largely ready to, to meet again. We'll circle, you know, we'll talk amongst ourselves and figure out sort of the best format for that. Um, but really do look forward to um, seeing many of you in person in the near future. Um, I think I stopped, I'm going to stop sharing that, sorry. <laughs> but appreciate you all taking that poll. Just have a couple of plugs because we're actually all getting back together again on Zoom uh, next week on Tuesday. The Cleaner Air Partnership is having a meeting of our Technical Advisory Committee um, on June 28th at 11.30 a.m. to talk about carbon farming as a greenhouse gas reduction strategy. So this carbon farming concept is heavily featured in local climate action plans, including the draft released by Sacramento County. We really wanna learn more about carbon farming. So we have a whole bunch of great experts and others who will be joining us. Kathy dropped a link to register in the chat. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and then Valley Vision is also working on uh, efforts to coordinate regionally around the Community Economic Resilience Fund. We have Issa Avancena on the call with us. Um, uh, this is the SURF program that you may have heard about. It's a $600 million program. It's a core piece of the state's just transition strategy, um, helping regions plan and implement low carbon inclusive economic development strategies and workforce strategies too. Um, so we actually have an application due in one month, right, Isa? So, so that's, that's a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> and folks can reach out to Isa or, or hit that link uh, if they're interested in further engagement. Um, so Kathy is now sharing a link in the chat to a one minute evaluation of this luncheon. So you can provide additional feedback, you can give us tips, you can tell us what we did right or wrong, and then also give us ideas for future luncheons. So again, we would love to hear your input on what to focus, in, focus on uh, in terms of a future conversation. And then of course, lastly, a recording of this webinar will be available on Valley Vision's YouTube channel. Um, I'll send you all a link to it via email early next week, and then I hope you all Enjoy your afternoon. Thanks again for joining us. I, 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 we, I definitely want to take a moment, though, to, to thank our, our panelists, the fellow panelists who took uh, time out from their days to share with us what they're doing. Um, we really appreciate that and the hard work that they're doing. So, you know, thank you very much, Chris and Colleen, Debbie and Corey, significantly. Absolutely. Thank you all for your expertise. And then for all of you who joined us today, really appreciate it. Happy Friday and enjoy your weekend. <laughs> Bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.